Up next in the broadcast, Pyongyang approves former South Korean First Lady Lee Hee-ho for a humanitarian visit to children's centers in North Korea. But details on the timing and her health needs have yet to be finalized. U.S. President Barack Obama announces an overhaul of the U.S. immigration system, but his strategy of using his power of executive order puts him on a collision course with the Republican-controlled Congress. Taking a cue from Japan's recent economic foibles, Korea's finance minister pledges real structural reforms to get the real economy going here in the nation. Experts say changes need to start with the ailing labor market. Primetime News begins now. Hello and welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Hwang Sung-hee filling in for Kang Chedi. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin with the latest inter-Korean dialogue on a possible trip to Pyongyang by a former South Korean first lady. Officials from the two Koreas met for talks and agreed to approve the trip on principle, but details remain pending. Our Connie Kim explains the impact of these discussions on overall South-North relations. Representatives from the two Koreas agreed on some of the details of former First Lady Lee Hee-ho's trip to Pyongyang during talks at the inter-Korean border town of Kaesong on Friday, namely that she will travel there by car. But other issues remain unresolved. We have decided that further discussions are needed on when the former First Lady will travel to the north and who will accompany her, because Madame Lee is older. We need to consult with her and her doctors and go over the details of today's talks. The North reportedly said it would allow the former First Lady to visit children's centers as she requested and provide kids there with hand-knitted hats and clothes. Lee made her request for a humanitarian visit to the North last month during a meeting with President Park geun -hye. But there are concerns Pyongyang may use her trip for political purposes as it comes ahead of the third anniversary in December of former North Korean leader Kim Jong-il's death. Lee Hee-ho visited Pyongyang three years ago to attend Kim Jong-il's funeral and met with current North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Experts say the former First Lady's trip is unlikely to have any meaningful impact on improving inter-Korean ties. It's not likely to change anything unless Madam Yi delivers a letter from President Park Geun-hye. Representatives from the two sides are set to reach out next week to arrange dates for a second round of talks on the former First Lady's trip. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Russia's foreign ministry says President Vladimir Putin is willing and ready to hold a one-on-one -on -one with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. And that's not all. It says Pyongyang is also willing to return to the six-party nuclear talks. Kwon Soa has this report. As soon as Kim Jong-un's special envoy Choi ryong hees plans to visit Russia were announced, speculation lit up about a potential summit between the leaders of North Korea and Russia. On Thursday, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Russian President Vladimir Putin is ready for one-on-one -on -one talks with the North Korean leader. Speaking to reporters after his closed-door discussions with Choi, Lavrov also said North Korea had expressed a willingness to return to the long-stalled international talks on its denuclearization, calling it a, quote, very significant political progress. Pyongyang is ready to restart the six-way nuclear talks without preconditions on the basis of a joint statement issued in 2005. We fully support this decision and will also be working with all concerned parties, including the United States, Japan and South Korea, to seek common trust for the resumption of the negotiations. The six-party talks have not been held for almost six years. North Korea withdrew from the negotiating table in late 2008 after restarting its nuclear enrichment program. Thursday's talks also focused on the two countries' economic partnership. The officials discussed Russian companies' participation in the inter-Korean Kaesong industrial complex and a joint project that would modernize North Korea's railway system.
Lavrov says North Korea is ready to open lines of communication with South Korea on trilateral projects if everything goes smoothly. That would include a project to transport Russian gas to South Korea through North Korea. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. In response to North Korea's latest threat to carry out another nuclear test, Washington says Pyongyang will not achieve anything through threats and provocations. At a press briefing on Thursday, Pentagon spokesperson Rear Admiral John Kirby said North Korea's belligerence will undermine international efforts for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and further isolate the regime. On Tuesday, a U.N. Human Rights Committee adopted a resolution pushing for the North Korean leadership to be brought to The Hague for crimes against humanity. North Korea followed with a threat to strengthen its war deterrence. President Park received the credentials of three new ambassadors to Seoul earlier today, including U.S. Ambassador Mark Lippert. During talks with Lippert, who's known to be a trusted advisor to President Barack Obama, the South Korean leader highlighted international unity in pressuring Pyongyang to give up its nuclear weapons. The American diplomat said Washington will continue to closely consult with Seoul on the matter and maintain the international momentum to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue. President Bach also sought U.S. support for her peace initiative in Northeast Asia. Korea's finance minister has pledged to push forward with structural reforms next year to achieve a full-fledged recovery. An economist at the Asian Development Bank says much of the emphasis should be geared toward the labor market. Our Hwang Jie has more. Structural reform is the key to a solid recovery momentum. That's what Korean Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan said on Friday during a meeting with the heads of major economic research institutes. While promising to focus on such reforms next year, Che added that Korea's recovery momentum remains weak, despite the government's aggressive set of stimulus measures. Che said Korea should take note from Japan, which has seen its economy fall into another slump due to a lack of structural reforms. An economist at the Asian Development Bank says any reforms should spread the benefits of growth among the people. I Focusing too much on the supply side of the economy, we have not been able to pay enough attention, adequate attention that the Korean uh, public deserved in the demand side. So the, a lot of these uh, uh, structural reforms have to be empowering the uh, people who have, been, who have not been involved properly in the growth process. Park added that more of an emphasis should be placed on reforming the country's labor market. Our labor force participation is very low, especially the female labor force participation is, uh, you know, it's really the one of the big constraints to unlocking the uh, growth potential for Korea. Experts also say that structural reforms should include reducing the level of debt, especially among public institutions, and that deregulation measures are crucial for building up confidence in the business sector. Reflecting such calls, the Korean government is expected to draw up its economy management plan for 2015 next month, which will also include new growth outlooks. Hong Jie, Arirang News. Korea has apparently been investing a lot in research and development. The science ministry says the amount spent on R&D compared to GDP tops the world rankings. And this isn't the first time. Song Ji-san has the details. Korea's reputation as one of the world's leading ICT powerhouses didn't just fall into its lap. A survey conducted by the science ministry shows Korea allocated a higher proportion of its GDP to R&D than any other country in the world for the second consecutive year. In terms of amount, Korea placed six at 54 billion U.S. dollars in 2012 after the U.S., Japan, China, Germany and France. But compared to proportion of GDP, Korea was the only country to invest more than 4 percent of its GDP on research and development in 2013. Roughly 76% of the investment came from the private sector, 
with foreign investors accounting for a mere 0.3 percent. Despite the heavy spending, researchers say more needs to be done to ensure the fruits of their labor are put to practical use. Developing new technologies is not enough. They must be commercialized, and they must open up business opportunities that attract investors. In a similar report last week, the OECD pointed out that Korea's strength in R&D lies in its strong ICT infrastructure, but that Seoul needs to boost international cooperation and joint research. To cater to such needs, the government announced plans to attract R&D centers of multinational companies by offering them more benefits when they established regional R&D headquarters in the country. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. The value of cars coming in from Europe has outpaced the number of Korean cars going overseas for the first time ever. Sales of German brands in particular have gone through the roof. Our Shin Min looks into the Euro car fever. A few years ago, European automakers called Korea an impossible market to crack. But this year, European exports to Korea are on a path to exceed Korean exports to Europe. The nation's customs data shows the value of car imports from European countries was up 60 percent to over 4.5 billion U.S. dollars in the first nine months of the year, whereas Korea's car exports stood around 4.4 billion. Local sales of European cars, particularly German brands, have been on the rise. They have become so popular that some auto retailers have had to put customers on a waiting list for months. So why this shift in consumers' taste? Better gas mileage bought me. The comfort of the ride is much higher, not to mention its widely known brand power. And the Korea-EU free trade agreement that went into effect in 2011 lowered price tax, attracting more drivers to European brands. This year alone, foreign car sales in the country rose at a pace 10 times faster than Hyundai's. And the weakening Japanese currency has been undermining Korean makers' competitiveness. The performance of Korean automakers in the European market is falling, and this trend is likely to continue. Even Hyundai and Kia Motors, which have manufacturing plants located in Europe for better supply to the local market, are losing ground because of lowered competitiveness due to the weak yen. But as the global auto industry is moving towards green cars, the analyst added Korean makers should improve fuel efficiency and move on to new technology quickly if they don't want to fall too far behind the competition. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Fans of video games and online games will get a thrill in Busan this weekend at the nation's largest gaming exhibition. Kim Ji-yeeon shows us some of the latest technological innovations to hit the gaming industry. More than 600 companies from 35 countries are taking part in this year's GSAR Global Game Exhibition in Busan, one of the world's leading gaming companies at the event is Oculus. It has created Oculus Rift, a virtual reality system that enables users to control movements by turning their heads and moving their hands. Um, last few decades, people have been experiencing their content with a 2D flat panel TVs. With a movie named Avatar, people had been watching the movie with a series copy 3D. However, that wasn't enough. People weren't able to feel immersed into the real world. Oculus believes virtual reality will evolve and forever change the way people play games, swap content, and communicate with each other. So in the near future, when this virtual reality becomes really popular, we believe that people will be able to interact, people from overseas, in virtual world, and be able to see each other and be able to interact with each other. So you'll be more like virtual reality Skype. The four-day event is also a chance for businesses to expand their opportunities globally. U.S.-based app Ania, a provider of mobile market data and analytics for app stores, are taking part in order to reach out to Korean developers. If you compare it to five years ago, you have a PC game, you have an online game, uh, you need to, you want to launch in China, you need to look for partners there, look for servers there, look for payment solutions there. You want to launch in US, you need to find another partner. But now these days, if you want to launch an app business, you just need to upload your app to uh, I, Apple iTunes Store or uh, Google Play and then instantly you are selling worldwide. 
A study released by the Korea Creative Content Agency estimated the country's gaming industry to be worth around 8.7 billion U.S. dollars as of 2013. Also, Korea's mobile gaming content industry almost tripled in 2013 from the previous year to more than 2 billion U.S. dollars. Kim Jeong, Arirang News, Busan. U.S. President Barack Obama has ordered sweeping changes to the U.S. immigration system, setting the stage for a showdown with Republican leaders. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, this executive order has the potential to change the lives of millions of undocumented workers living in the United States. What's his plan of action? Well, in a national address Thursday, Obama said the measures would protect illegal migrants and their families from deportation under certain conditions. He said the executive action was common sense and criticized Congress for failing to address what he called a broken system. If realized, it will be the biggest step towards U.S. immigration reform in a generation. Our Lee ji has more. Over 11 million undocumented immigrants live in the United States. Now, nearly half of them might just be able to come out of the shadows. On Thursday, U.S. President Barack Obama announced an executive order hoping to fix the country's broken immigration system once and for all. If you've been in America for more than five years, if you have children who are American citizens or legal residents, if you register, pass a criminal background check, and you're willing to pay your fair share of taxes, you'll be able to apply to stay in this country temporarily without fear of deportation. The executive action covers up to 5 million people, but will not grant citizenship or give immigrants the right to stay in the country permanently. As for mass deportation, Obama said it would both be impossible and contrary to America's values. Although his executive order has the force of law, the Republican-dominated Congress is getting ready to fight the president tooth and nail. Congressional Republicans are considering all options, ranging from defunding the plan to even a government shutdown. President Obama preemptively responded to the arguments in his address. The actions I'm taking are not only lawful, they're the kinds of actions taken by every single Republican president and every single Democratic president for the past half century. Amid all the immigration talk, a new survey found that the number of illegal South Korean immigrants in the U.S. stood at around 180,000 as of 2012. This puts South Korea as the eighth largest group of illegal immigrants in the U.S. Lee Jun, Arirang News. And turning to the U.K., Prime Minister David Cameron's Conservative Party has been dealt a heavy blow following defeat in Thursday's by-elections in what experts say could prove to be a key moment in British politics. The U.K. Independence Party was declared the winner on Friday, securing their second seat in Parliament. The right-wing party is seeking an immediate exit from the European Union, as well as a stricter immigration controls. UK leaders said the result was not merely a protest against the government, but a sign of a greater political shift, one that could tip the balance in the next general elections. In the growing public support, the anti-EU movement is raising concerns among businesses, investors and European partners that the country may fall further away from the 20-nation bloc. And shifting to Japan, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has dissolved the lower house of parliament, paving the way for snap elections next month. The move is raising questions over whether the shakeup will secure public support for Abe's long term economic reforms. Our Chi Myung Gil sheds light on the answer. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe hopes his decision to dissolve the lower house of parliament and call snap elections next month ultimately gives him a fresh mandate to push through reforms as his signature economic policies dubbed Abenomics struggle to revive Japan's ailing economy. A controversial sales tax increase lies at the center of the issue. The first hike in April from 5 to 8 percent was meant to curb public debt, but instead made Japanese consumers tighten their wallets. That has been blamed in part for dismal third-quarter economic figures when gross domestic product shrank 1.6 percent on-year, pushing the Japanese economy into recession. A second sales tax increase to 10 percent was scheduled for October next year, but Abe is now hoping to delay it.
Advocates say the tax hike is needed to fund social security costs for a fast aging population. But while the Japanese public is largely opposed to the tax increase, they are also confused about Prime Minister Abe's tactics. According to a survey conducted by the Asai Shimbun, some 62 percent did not understand why Abe had suddenly dissolved parliament. Some 65 percent said it was inappropriate for Abe to use a snap election as a barometer of sentiment toward a second sales tax hike. Over the election campaign period, Abe is expected to explain his government's growth strategy and ask that people support for his Liberal Democratic Party. Abe says he will resign if his party fails to secure a majority in the lower house of parliament in the December 14th snap elections. But despite waning public approval ratings, the LDP is widely expected to win. Tim young Adirang News. And finally, returning to the U.S., it's that time of year again when major retail chains began rolling out their annual decorations ahead of a massive wave of holiday shoppers. In New York City, Macy's flagship department store unveiled their famous Christmas displays on Thursday night. The spectacular show of lights and toys has become an iconic attraction, bringing huge crowds each year. On the economic side, U.S. retailers are hoping to keep the momentum of strong sales from last month right up to Christmas Eve. Other data on this Friday showed consumer sentiment had reached a seven-year high in November. This as American households are expected to spend over $600 billion this holiday season. And that wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here next week. Hello and welcome, I'm Stephen Che with a look at sports. Starting on the ice, the ISU World Cup of Speed Skating kicked off in Seoul with a packed schedule. But much of the focus was on the ladies' 500-meter race. There, points leader Lee sang placed second behind Japan's Nao Kodaira by 0.13 seconds and saw her World Cup gold medal streak dating back to March last year snap at 10. She'll have a chance to redeem herself on home ice in Division A's second 500-meter race Saturday. And looking at other Korean podium finishes, Moteba won the men's 500-meter silver for his highest finish so far this season. In Division B, Kim Jin-soo topped the men's 1,500-meter race, while Ibora placed third in the women's 500-meter event. And turning to the KBL doubleheader, first up in Busan, the KT Sonic Boom hosted the Dongbu Promi. And it's a tight contest as KT's Charles Rose and Dongbu's David Simon trade shots. But KT can't buy a bucket in the fourth, scoring just four points there, handing the Promi their third win in a row. Meanwhile, Osegun records a double-double for KGC as they crush the KCC Aegis by 18 points in the win on the road. And now to golf first, to the unfolding action at the LPGA's season-ending CME Group Tour Championship in Florida. Julieta Granada at 6-under took the first-round lead at Tiburon, but eyes were on the Pagan B Stacy Lewis showdown. Pac has a slope to climb at 1-under, while Lewis's late eagle put her at 3-under par. Meanwhile, Rory McIlroy came back from his weeks-long break to take care of legal issues and shot six under par for the first-round lead at the European Tours World Tour Championship. And finally, we go to Formula One, where it's all come down to the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix to determine the winner of the Drivers' Championship. And going into the last race on Sunday, Mercedes Lewis Hamilton holds a 17-point lead over teammate Nico Rosberg, despite having won 10 races this year to Rosberg's five wins. Simply put, Hamilton takes home the trophy if he finishes anywhere above Rosberg. Rosberg, meanwhile, needs to finish at least two spots above Hamilton or more, depending on his place on the circuit. Now, points are doubled for the season finale, so we can expect a tight and exciting race. Well, that's all I have for now. Your weather's up next. Have a wonderful weekend and good night.
TGIF, I'm Kim Bo-kyung with your weather forecast. It was a foggy but mild autumn day here in Seoul while heavy clouds hovered down south. And at the moment, it is raining in parts of Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon provinces. So it looks like rain clouds will gradually move down south, leading to less than 5 millimeters of precipitation for parts of the central regions. Otherwise, those of you planning outdoor activities should keep in mind that finest levels may be on the rise. As for the weekend, aside from the big gap in numbers between the day and night, it looks like mild autumn conditions will continue. On to Saturday's readings, Seoul reaches 14, Gwangju makes it to 17, Busan hits 19. On to other regions, Daejeon hits 15, while Jeju peaks at 19. Those are the updates I have for you now. Have a lovely Friday evening. That's primetime news on this Friday. I'm Hwang Sung-hee. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Sean Lim. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.